Hi. This is a presentation I did for a class at the local university, CU Boulder, and it's about pets. But first, quickly, let me tell you who I am. I'm Patrick Walsh. I'm the CEO of Iron Core Labs, and I'm a lifelong, long-time privacy advocate. I have a background in cryptography and threat research and privacy tools like pets and in enterprise application development. So we'll talk today a little bit about the state of privacy. First, explaining kind of the setting in which pets sit and what they are and aren't good for. And then we'll get into specific building blocks and technologies used for pets. All right, so I'm not gonna talk down to anyone. What is privacy? You probably have some idea. But more importantly, no one really knows the definition of privacy because it varies depending on who you ask and what the context is. It's just different almost everywhere. I personally love Wikipedia's definition because it allows people to isolate data about themselves so they can express themselves selectively. It certainly isn't the legal definition, but it plays well with the emotional feeling of what it means when we talk about privacy. Every man should know that his conversations, his correspondence, and his personal life are private. I like the sentiment. All right, so in the US, our federal laws around privacy protect individuals from government snooping into their private lives without reasonable cause and judicial approval, at least for direct invasions. But we've never had general privacy protections at the federal level that protect us from our service providers, from private companies, or from the government going to our service providers. So now you might say that HIPAA is an exception as it protects the privacy of our health data. But that's not entirely true because it only applies to healthcare providers like doctors and hospitals. Our credit card companies are free to sell information about our purchases. Our internet providers can sell information about our browsing habits. Our telcos can sell information about our phone calls and our location. And all of these things happen on both an individual basis and an aggregate. AT&T used to have a program called Horizons, where they sold all this kind of data to governments for a fee. And in the US, your privacy protections against government intrusion just don't apply to data the government can purchase. But you say we have the Fourth Amendment. Yes, but there are a ton of exceptions. If you voluntarily, quote unquote, give your information to a third party, such as a corporation, then you forfeit your reasonable expectation of privacy. That standard was first set in a 1967 Supreme Court ruling and is referred to as the third party doctrine. And since then, the standard has been refined in other court cases and clarified in legislation like the Wiretap Act and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. So other exceptions include if you're within 100 miles of the border, then border patrol agents can conduct a wireless search of your, sorry, a warrantless search of your possessions. No reasonable suspicion required. And if you have a conversation in a public place, well, According to a court ruling out of San Diego, it's, quote, unrealistic for anyone to believe that conversations can be private given that there are video cameras on many street corners, storefronts, and front porches in the hand of nearly every person who owns a smartphone. That case, by the way, that ruling came down because of FBI agents who, agents who planted microphones in a courthouse and listened in on privileged conversations between attorneys and their clients and then used those against the clients in court. And although you would think that would be privileged, the fact that they had the conversation in a public place like a courthouse means that they had no reasonable expectation of privacy. All right, so in the US, what's our biggest privacy problem? Think about it for a second. What do you think? I'd argue it's money. There are bigger incentives to know as much as possible about each of us than there are disincentives to the same. We may want to have private lives, but knowing what those private lives are is big business. So I'm going to tell you a story about a woman named Anya Prince. She and her husband found out that they were pregnant. And like most couples, they didn't want to tell anyone until after the first trimester when they were sure the pregnancy would come to term. Now, Anya is a professor studying health and privacy, so she had some ideas about how to go about this. Unlike most couples, they wanted to keep this secret not just from friends and family, but also from advertisers. And so they went to some extremes. All pregnancy-related purchases, that's like unscented lotions, prenatal vitamins, etc., only in person and only in cash. 
All internet searches were done in private windows over a VPN with privacy search engines instead of Google. They didn't use any femtech apps to track the pregnancy or anything like that. They turned off their phone's GPS when going to medical appointments. In other words, they did about as much as you can possibly do to try and keep this private and secret. Quote, Yet because of the lack of data privacy in the U.S., the day finally came when I lost my battle to keep my reproductive information private. I was sitting on my couch, scrolling through social media when I saw it. An advertisement for diapers. It appeared the same week that we lost the pregnancy. So what can you do personally? You know, I'm, I'm here not because my expertise is in the law. I'm here today because I'm going to talk to you about privacy preserving technologies. But here's what you have to absolutely understand. There isn't that much you can do to protect your own privacy from companies you do business with. Privacy preserving technologies, the ones I'm going to talk about, aren't exactly things that you can use without them. They're actually for them to use to protect your data that they hold. So I lock down my own data very strictly, and we can talk about that in a different presentation, but I still get notices about my health data, my financial data, and other things getting breached. It happens to me at the rate of at least two a year. Companies control our privacy. This is why I founded Iron Core Labs because these companies need better tools to do better with our data. The only way these companies will adopt these types of controls is if they're forced to, by their customers or by regulations or both. Okay, so what, let's talk about what that means. You know, Why would they adopt them? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the incentives and disincentives. Companies want you to trust them. So they always, all of them across the board, they talk big, big game about how trustworthy they are, how they'll protect you and protect your data. But their incentives are to hold on to as much information about you as possible. Those incentives are very strong. The regulations are getting better, but they're still dwarfed by the profit that comes from tracking you and holding your data. And I'll illustrate this in just a second. But first, let's talk about GDPR. All right, so GDPR is the European privacy law, and it's amazing because it has this global impact. It doesn't just apply to EU companies, it applies to any company that holds the data of EU citizens. And while it has a ton of requirements from transparency and consent to data protection, it's the data protection ones that matter when we talk about pets. And that comes down to two articles, articles 25 and 32. They deal with a company's ability to protect the data it holds. And look, GDPR is also unique in that its fines can be up to 4% of revenue in extreme cases, global revenue. But in practice, they sometimes look at per country revenue or per product line or, you know, it, it, what actually happens varies quite a bit. The other interesting one is California's privacy law. We really haven't seen it become a force in practice yet, but it took GDPR some three years to start growing some teeth and leveling fines at people that are meaningful. And so, you know, maybe next year or so we'll start to see CCPA do the same. But what's interesting here is that CCPA has a dedicated office that deals with the privacy violation aspects, but the law allows for direct lawsuits against companies that get breached by hackers. So on the security side, individuals can actually band together and sue and receive minimum damages of $100 per person, even if they can't show harm. So today, you can't really you know, sue companies unless you can prove it was their data breach that caused harm to you and you know, caused your identity to be stolen. When, when you get multiple per year, how can you prove that? So it could be huge. If CCPA were in effect when Equifax was breached, instead of about a billion dollars in costs, they would have seen about 14 billion in costs, which likely would have driven them to bankruptcy. So GDPR started to get some teeth beginning last year. That's some three years after it went into effect. Meta has had almost a billion dollars. Actually, they've had over a billion dollars in fine. They've had almost a billion euros in fine so far. And that's incredibly significant. It should drive at least a little bit of change at Facebook. 
But let's put that into perspective. Consider for a moment how small that is compared to one simple change made by Apple that denied Facebook a single piece of information that they use to correlate your data across different apps and websites. They added this thing called app tracking transparency. And this year, 2022, it's cost Meta some 12.8 billion. And all that this app tracking transparency really does is one, it tells you how an app is gonna use your data. And two, it asks if you want to allow that app to track you across contexts, across apps and websites to see what you do on those. If you say no, Apple doesn't give the app your device ID. That's it. That's the entire thing. That's cost 12.8 billion. And it only applies to iPhone users. Oh, and I'm an iPhone user, but if, you know, if you're using your desktop computer, it still doesn't apply. It's only for when you're using your iPhone. Think about that. By the way, Meta has lost like 50% of the value of its stock since this happened. Here's the other thing. I'll say this, this 12.8 billion is a lot, but they make over 100 billion in revenue per year. So to put all this stuff in perspective, it, there's still an awful lot that they're making. Okay, let's talk for a minute about contracts. One thing that GDPR does is it requires these data processing agreements. They have these things called standard contractual clauses that they put out that says, hi, you know, if you're going to do business, you're going to be handling EU data, or you're going to be delegating processing of data that you're handled to another company, you need to put into place these data processing agreements or DPAs. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about my company, because a couple years ago, we had never seen a single one of these. And GDPR went into effect in 2018. Um, but last year and this year, we haven't seen a single deal with a reasonably sized company that didn't include a data processing agreement. And most of them far exceeded the standard contractual causes, clause, clauses, sorry. Um, so what are these? They're contracts between a data controller, the entity that collects the data and the data processor. So we're talking about business to business kind of setups, platform providers like AWS and SaaS providers and people like that. Now. For us, the way this has worked out is that we have ended up having to have liability caps per customer that are in the millions each. And that means that if we get breached and we leak some data of, of our customer's customers, for example, or the data that our customers hold, um, well, they can come after us and they can come after us for an awful lot of money each. Now. Because we hold almost no personal information of people, we, we keep it extremely minimal. Um, basically just names and emails and, and then only of select people who we need to be able to log into our system for whatever reason. Because of that, if we were to be facing fines from GDPR, they would likely be under $100,000. So consider for a moment that our contractual penalties are potentially in the many millions of dollars versus our you know, GDPR fines, which are in maybe the five figures, maybe the six figures at best. So for us, GDPR isn't that worrisome, but the data processing agreements are. Also, I should point out that for a lot of the privacy um, legislation, they apply mostly just to big companies. All right, which brings us to pets. Not a trick question. What are pets? So pets start, stands for privacy enhancing technologies. The way you should think of it is this. These are the things that protect the data. The, they, they sit at the intersection of privacy and security and focus on the security of personal data, keeping that data from unauthorized viewers. Now, personal data includes things like emails and first and last names, also addresses, location information, all kinds of things. These are things that a few years ago, no one thought twice about holding or collecting. For some 30 years, it's been no big deal to hold a ton of email addresses and never clean that out. Um, but now, if that data is breached, the consequences are much higher. The more you hold, the higher the fines. So we call personally identifying information, PII, toxic now to make the point that you should be afraid to touch it 
and to hold it. And you want to get rid of it as soon as you don't need it. So when people talk about data protection and security of data, they mostly think about protecting it from hackers. But in fact, hackers are just hackers are just one threat to data. Insiders are the other, and often the two are indistinguishable. For example, think about a hacker stealing the login credentials of a trusted employee or guessing them or whatever. Each person should be able to see no more data than they must in order to do their job. And even then, we have to ask if they really need to see the data. For example, it may be important to know if someone is an adult, but that doesn't mean that they need to know exact age or date of birth. So isn't it kind of silly to try to protect data from the people who hold it? Is that even what we're really talking about? Well, yes, in short, yes. If the data is necessary, then it is held, and our job is to protect it even from the holders of the data so that only certain processes or a limited set of people ever have access, if at all. Or maybe they hold the data, but they don't have access. So it's worth stopping to think about Anya's story and whether any pets or any technical solutions would help her out. She had ad trackers, didn't help. So unfortunately, this is a story not of someone looking at her email or stealing or peeking at her data, but of breadcrumbs gathered, analyzed, and leveraged to label her. That's done automatically and by machines. The ad could have keyed off of an IP address or something so that the ad network possibly didn't even know who they were delivering the ad to. But that isn't a data protection problem. It's a regulatory one. And one that companies that rely on advertising revenue will fight tooth and nail to preserve with the status quo. So the answer to this question, would pets help Anya? No, because it doesn't change what companies hold and what they do with that data. It only changes whether individuals are able to see that data. It reduces the likelihood of a data breach. It's more of a security solution for where people are holding data than it is one of, of generalized privacy help, unfortunately. But here's where it would help, right? Um, I'm going to use Uber as an example. I could pick on T-Mobile or LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook again, but you know, Uber is the most recent and their total compromise is a nice object lesson. So, so what happened with Uber? Okay. A teenager started targeting contractors of Uber, got some passwords, but Uber uses two-factor authentication and it pushes a request to the employee's phone saying, Hey, do you want to allow this login? So he just re repeatedly tried to log in as them, reached out to them over WhatsApp to say he was from Uber IT and could they please grant him access. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, but after an hour of annoying notifications, this person finally relented and said, fine, get in. Once the hacker was in the network, they found a network share with some scripts that had admin user login credentials. Okay, They used those to gain access to the rest of the network, to source code, to repositories of secrets and other with other passwords and to internal tools like Slack and Confluence and to databases of customer data. Now, in this case, we aren't sure if the attacker downloaded any of that customer data, so it may be an imperfect example, but they had access to it. It looks like they were just there to make a point about drivers being underpaid. It's like the digital equivalent of a joyride, if you will. But this is one place where pets would be incredibly useful. A bad actor got some credentials, used them to poke around and steal stuff. The risk of that stuff causing problems can be brought way down with the use of pets. So this guy here, if you don't recognize him, his name is uh, Peter Zatko, otherwise known as Mudge. This isn't his first time testifying before Congress. In fact, uh, he's kind of famous for being uh, the first hacker to testif testify in front of Congress um, back in the 90s. Really cool, go look it up. But that's another story. Mudge used to run DARPA and then most recently was in charge of security for Twitter. He put out a very lengthy whistleblower report about their shortcomings, and there were a lot. But buried in the avalanche of disappointing details was this nice little tidbit. More than half of Twitter employees had full access to everything, and there was no way to track who was speaking at what. Meanwhile, other whistleblowers have said that it was common practice for employees to spy on the private direct messages of celebrities just out of curiosity. The point is this, whether an employee is overly curious or malicious, and by the way, a few employees of Twitter turned out to be agents of other countries, Saudi Arabia in particular, who were arrested for espionage. <laughs> 
insiders are a concern. Also, again, remember, think of that Uber thing. They found credentials. If those credentials didn't have access to the data, all would have been fine, right? All right, so what are pets good for? But they're not good for a lot of things. You know, hacker protection, minimizing trust. Um, we're talking about protecting against hacks, protecting against misconfigurations uh, where something is made public on accident. Um, and companies use vendors for all kinds of stuff. They're email providers and so on. Each of these can also see some of the data that the company has. So when we start talking about pets, we think about companies and all of their vendors all together using these technologies to keep the private data safe. So pets reduce problems with propagation of data and widening circles of people and systems with access by minimizing trust. Still with me? All right, hang in there. Let's get into the real stuff. There's basically three major approaches. I'll call them reduce, obscure, and secure. Reduce might seem obvious. Collect less, use retention policies to automatically delete after processing. This is probably the hardest one for for companies to do, not because it's hard to delete something, but because they hate to get rid of data and they don't often know what all is using it. So if they go and they say, ah, you know, we looked at that driver's license, we saw that this person was an adult, now we can delete that driver's license. Oh, but what if we need it again, right? Those worries. It's actually really hard to figure out data retention, data retention policies and the enforcement of those processes. Those, those kind of policies, even if you are only collecting what you need, holding it for only as long as you need it is challenging. And there are tools and, and things for doing this specific part of the problem. The next one I'll talk about is obscure. Obscure is um, a category with a lot of different approaches, some of which are pretty widely deployed. And I'll touch on a couple of those. So suppose we have a list of people with account IDs, names and account balances at, at a bank somewhere. Okay, we can tokenize the names. This is kind of a way of doing pseudonymization, which basically means giving a, swapping out a name with a different name that's, that's not real. If we tokenize all the people here, um, you know, then we make it sort of anonymous. But of course, you know, pseudonymization, sort of anonymous. But of course, it only gets us so far. So if we look at this data here, there's something that really sticks out right away, you know, which one of these likely belongs to Jeff Bezos, who we happen to know banks here? You know, it's that's an easy question to answer. It's number three, right? So next we, we can look at a technique called k-anonymization. Um, k-anonymization is sort of the scientific approach to this. The um, less scientific approaches are sometimes called generalization or bucketing. Um, in k-anonymization, the idea is that you um, don't need the specific information, but you can instead capture uh, uh, kind of a blurry version of the information. In this case, we'll take their um, account balances and we'll put them into buckets. Uh, so people one and two are between zero and 150,000 and people three and four are over a million dollars. Great. In this case, we've made sure that every given bucket has at least two people in it. K equals two, that's where we get K anonymization. That means that, you know, with K equals two, you flip a coin on whether or not Bezos is three or four. Um, you know, if we had K equals 20, it would be a little bit harder to find which one is him. The trouble with obscuring the, the kind of obscurity approach, it, it's useful. Let me be clear, it's useful. It has places where it makes a lot of sense, but it can be problematic. And one of those is that when you tokenize, you only move the data from one database to another one without actually adding any protection to it. So, you know, generalization can be problematic in a couple of ways. Um, another thing that, that comes up is that often the data is still identifying, particularly when you start adding more and more of it together, more data points, instead of just those two columns of, of information or three columns of information, you start adding more things or you're able to combine with outside information. And finally, re-identification is trivial with sufficient data points, period. As an example of what I'm talking about, take a look at these kinds of puzzles called cryptograms. My 97-year-old grandma does these. The way they usually work is there's some kind of famous quote. Each letter is substituted for another letter and you have to guess what 
those the letters are substituted for it. Essentially, we've tokenized, we've pseudonymized each letter. And so we look at this and we start picking at it and we say, ah, you know, and this in this picture, this example, the numbers there say how often a particular letter occurred. And that's one of the clues that we can use to start to guess um, which letters go where. Cryptograms are just a form of re-identification. And in many cases, they're even harder than re-identification and they're not that hard. One of the easier to understand ways to re-identify data is to look at location data. So weather tracking apps often record people's locations, even when they aren't using the app. And then the weather apps, a number of them do anyway, aggregate all the data together, strip off any personal identifiers like names, and then they sell this data. The data is like used by real estate planners and marketers and researchers and many more. But here's the thing. Usually the individual locations are linked. So you can see that you don't know who, but some person A, whoever they are, went you know, to X and then to Y and then to Z. But now what if you take that information and you join it? You join it to this public information. And that public information tells you things like where a person lives or where a person works. Well, it's highly likely that that location data is showing person A's residence and person A's office and perhaps person A's children's school or whatever, right? As soon as you start looking at these data points, you know, one set at a time, you can pretty easily figure out who it's referring to most of the time. Okay, so let's talk about that third category, the entirely different approaches to use encryption. And when we're talking about pets, we're often talking about less common and more fancy encryption that enables different types of operations over the encrypted data. That's not necessarily the case, but that's often the case. And so what I wanna to talk to you ne about next is some different techniques that can be used in various um, commercial products. I'm not gonna talk about commercial products. Instead, I'm gonna talk about these building blocks that can be used in them and are used in them to make data more secure. But before we go there, it's helpful to understand something first. Most software companies will tell you that they already encrypt your data. They'll say something like, with military grade encryption, or it's encrypted in transit and at rest. And they make it sound like that's some sort of data protection. But it rarely is. When something is encrypted at rest, it usually means at the low level, like the disk level or the database level, but underneath the database, kind of underneath the operating system. That means it protects the data when someone gets a hold of the hard drive, pulls it out of the computer, or digs it out of a dumpster. That's important. Co companies should have this. But on a running server, if someone gets onto the server, all the data is just visible. It's like there's no protection at all at that point if they're on the server, if the hard drive is in it, because, because servers run 24-7. The antidote is something called application layer encryption. It's a real simple concept. It means that you encrypt the data and then store it. That's it. So you encrypt it. You know, it happens above the operating sub system level. On a running server with application layer encryption or ALE, you get into the server and the data is still locked and requires some kind of key to unlock it. That's what we're talking about here. All of the solutions I'm about to talk about are ALE solutions. All right, first pattern is end-to-end -end encryption. Arguably, this one's the most secure. And the idea is that the server that holds the data or that the data passes through, if we're talking about communications or something, doesn't possess a key or any way of decrypting the data. So the data is encrypted at the first person and decrypted by the second person and the server doesn't have to be trusted at all. So Apple devices use this pattern for a number of things. For example, facial recognition on an Android works by uploading a photo to Google's servers Google does the facial recognition checks there and sends the results back to the phone on demand. But with Apple, the photos uploaded to their servers are encrypted and Apple doesn't hold the keys, asterisk, asterisk, unless you back up your keys with them and, and haven't used their brand new advanced encryption to protect those. So on Apple devices, the facial recognition happens on the phone or the iPad or the laptop instead of on Apple servers. And the idea there is that Apple never needs to see it. So apps can often accomplish many of the same things, but they have to do it client side, in the browser, on the phone, or whatever, in order to do that, which isn't always 
practical depending on the application. But regardless, if it is practical, that is the best privacy really you can get with encryption these days. Another pattern uses a concept called a zero knowledge proof. This is pretty cool and it's quite useful. So the data is encrypted in such a way that it can be queried for specific types of queries and it can attest to certain outcomes. And this can be done without revealing the inputs which are encrypted. So for example, you can test to see if someone is a resident of the EU without learning where they were born, or you can test if someone is an adult without learning their birth date. Then if someone steals the data, at, at most they can get that derived information. So this is particularly uh, useful when something is, is variable, like a person you know, who is under 18 today, we could capture them in our database as being a child, but you know, tomorrow they could be over 18. And so something like this gives a way of preserving that information without ex you know, risking its exposure or letting someone see it directly. It can also be used to prove that you've paid for something without saying who you are, among other things. The next tool in the PET toolkit for encryption is SMPC or Secure Multi-Party Computation. This has a very specific sort of utility where you want to calculate over a set of inputs while keeping the inputs secret. So for example, if we want all, if, if, if we all want to compare our salaries and then determine the maximum, the minimum, the average over them, but we each want to keep our own salary secret, then we can use SMPC. It's a neat trick and it can be applied to other types of problems too. So particularly when you want to split trust or secrets between parties, for example, by coming together to decrypt something without anyone gaining the info needed to decrypt by themselves in the future. So the classic way of splitting keys is called Shamir's algorithm, but at some point someone gets to reassemble the key that's used to decrypt the data and they could save that off. With secure multi-part computation, you basically all agree to calculate some function over the encrypted inputs, and then you all get to see the output without revealing the inputs. Okay, the next is a way to find encrypted data without decrypting it first. So this is this comes up a lot. People are like, well, I can't encrypt the data because then I won't be able to find it. What if I need to, you know, why would I encrypt the name? I need to look people up by their names or their address or their social security number, right? Well, this is a way of, of kind of having the best of both worlds. So the way encrypted search typically works is the server holds encrypted data. They're able to search over it, but the server knows neither what it's holding nor what was searched for. It passes back encrypted results. The search query itself is encrypted and the, the results are encrypted and a key is needed to create the query and a key is needed to decrypt the results. And if let's say the user or some intermediary holds those keys, then um, the server can remain ignorant of the data it holds. And then I wanna talk about what's probably the most important, but also most complicated to try to visualize type of encryption, uh, which is something called homomorphic encryption. So this is a mouthful. And it actually breaks down into a couple different types. There's partially homomorphic and there's fully homomorphic and all kinds of things in between. But look, the idea is this, you encrypt some data, you operate on the encrypted data. Let's say you wanna add, you know, you encrypt two numbers and you want to add those numbers together while they're encrypted or multiply them or whatever. You do that on the encrypted data without decrypting. But later, what you decrypt that encrypted result to get the answer so you encrypt you know, number X and you encrypt number Y, you add them together while they're encrypted, it's some garbagey data, but when you go to decrypt that Z value, you get the result of the operation. So does that make sense? It's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. Now, partially homomorphic encryption typically means just one operation is supported, like let's say addition. Fully homomorphic means you can do any kind of mathematical operation, which is a total dream because you can calculate averages over encrypted numbers and do much, much more. Um, fully homomorphic encryption is incredibly slow in practice and it's not practical for many applications, although they are finding interesting ways to apply the technology as smaller pieces of bigger crypto systems, um, but still lots of cool things, many possibilities. And you know, partially homomorphic techniques are generally much faster and they're being much more widely used right now today. In fact, some approaches to uh, searchable encryption, for example, use partially homomorphic techniques.
Which brings us to the end for today. There's more I could go over, but we'll stop here. Hopefully you understand now generally what pets are, where they fit into the general privacy picture, why they're used, for what and when, and what problems they do and do not solve. They do not preserve privacy in that they don't stop companies from collecting or making use of your data, but they do keep that data secure and find ways to minimize the number of people who can see it, and that includes hackers as well as insiders. The ones I toured through today are some of the most interesting or widely used, but there are challenges. You know, adoption of pets is not so widespread as you might hope. Lots of companies have been experimenting with different solutions, but relatively few are actually protecting the data they hold in meaningful ways, in my view. The pressures on companies to take more care with data are rising. Uh, Facebook, some of those fines that added up to a billion dollars came because there were breaches in the data and they were specifically held to account for not you know, better protecting the data in the security of processing and in the uh, data security by default and by design parts of the GDPR. Companies like mine are educating as fast as we can and making things as easy as we can to reduce the barriers, but it does remain an uphill battle. The biggest push for privacy tools right now that we're seeing is in Europe. The US is a laggard in many ways, and our lack of any federal privacy law is absolutely galling. Almost as galling would be a weak privacy law with no pen real penalties though, so I'm hoping if we do get one, we get a real one. But we need regulations. We need them to protect people like Anya, as well as you and me from ads, from our data being so stolen, sold, and trafficked about, and to help companies see that it is in their best interest to keep our data safe. That's it. Thanks for watching.